Hello, everybody. I'd like to talk about the rise of a process called model-based design and its impact on control engineering. It's a great time to be a controls engineer, turns out. The world has more things to control than it's ever had in, in the past. There are lower cost and more powerful embedded processors that you, you can use for more advanced control strategies. Also, the software tools that accelerate what you do are more powerful than they've ever been before. This is extending the reach of control engineering and control theory uh, and increasing the impact of all of us in the room that we can make on the world. Basically, the world is coming towards us as control engineers. The MathWorks makes tools for control engineers, and uh, we're involved heavily in all sorts of different industries, aerospace, automotive, consumer products. We get to see how control is being used in all these different industries. I'd like to share with you some of the things that we see going on in the industry uh, this evening. As a company, we have two basic software so platforms. Uh, it's the MATLAB and the Simulink. MATLAB really came out of people in this room and, and the controls in the educational community. You know, MATLAB originated in universities and uh, was first picked up in the controls area at the university level in education and then spread to industry. In, in the model-based design area, a Simulink oddly worked in the reverse. It really was driven by industry. Industry kept on saying, here's these things we really need. And we worked with, uh, with industry over really a period of about 15 years uh, trying to respond to the needs that industry had. And it's actually been a little slow be moving back to education. Uh, so I want to talk a bit about uh, the model-based design and the Simulink side and what I see as opportunities for education here. So I have a premise here and a suggestion for the future. My assertion here is that um, multi-domain modeling and model-based design have already transformed how complex systems are developed in industry. My other part of my key idea that I want to share tonight is coupled with technical trends that are going on, uh, they really have a big opportunity to transform education and research in, the, in control systems. The same way that the MATLAB environment, the tech computing, uh, transformed how things were done 20 years ago. I'm going to start by talking about some innovation megatrends from the past uh, 10 or so years, ones that really drove model-based design in industry. Industry ran into some trouble, okay? Uh, and the solution uh, arose in the form of model-based design, and I want to talk about that. And then I'd like to share with you the impact it's had on industry and some insights based upon industry learnings. And then finally, I'd like to suggest what the future impacts in industry and education could be and, and leave you with some take-home ideas at the end. So I'm going to start uh, by talking about what I call technology innovation megatrends. These are big megatrends that, that drive the world. These are things that you know, businesses come into being, in, whole industries come into being around these megatrends. So what's a megatrend? U.S. National Academy of Engineering made it easy. They have a list of the 20th century's uh, greatest engineering achievements. And uh, here's the top 15. It's amazing stuff. I mean, look at this. Electrification, the automobile, electronics, computers, telephones, spacecraft. You know, these all happened in the 20th century. You know, basically in the 19th and 18th century, science made fundamental discoveries in biology and chemistry and physics. But in the 20th century, the engineers turned these into, into amazing set of things that affect all of us in this room. A hundred years ago, we'd all be riding horses, okay? The Model T first came off the production line about a hundred years ago. Prior to that, you know, they, cars weren't available widely. You know, incredible transformation to where we are here, coming from all over the world, you know, it, uh, lighting and air conditioning, computers and all that. It's really, really quite remarkable. Look at the Internet. The Internet, of course, which, it, which is a more modern thing that we all think is so, such a huge innovation, the National Academy of Engineering only gives that 13th on the list. If I could add one more, of course, add automatic control theory to this list, but I'm biased. Okay, so truly these things transformed the world 100 years ago from this uh, to where we are today. You know, it's just, it, it's really a technical marvel if you sit back and think about these changes. If you have any friends that are economists, they'll tell you these are important, too, to economies and, and standard of living and quality of life. This is a chart that shows the growth in uh, gross domestic product per person, which is proportional to standards of living. You get similar charts like this in, in most any developed country. And it's increased a factor of 8x over this period, which is extraordinary. The leisure time we have, the, 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 you know, the fact that we're not out plowing fields and things like that. And so this is important. People care about this. And you can chart these things for companies. You can chart them for industries. You can chart them for individuals in some sense. And the point is, is that innovation drives the economy. That's what economists will tell you. So these trends are important uh, to focus on you know, for people in industry uh, as well as uh, education. There are some people who think that in 1947, 
the largest uh, tech innovation megatrend ever was the invention of the transistor. That's the fundamental enabling of the digital age. IEEE Spectrum, recent issue, had an, actually an assertion along these lines. Okay, there were innovation megatrends in 1984 that allowed MathWorks to get started as a company. We took advantage of one of these, and, and that's why I'm standing here today. When I was at Stanford studying control, this is how I did technical computing, believe it or not. This was state-of-the-art computing at Stanford University in 1980, punching cards to solve optimal control problems. That's how, that's how I learned optimal control. At the time, we had a you know, well-defined set of mathematics we wanted to do, uh, you know, ranging from linear algebra, uh, differential equations, their state, space, form, and linear, uh, the transfer function form. Also important were discrete time models, you know, state, space, difference equations, transfer functions, all the different names they're called in different areas. Fast Fourier transform. So, so a lot of these computational tools were new and understood, but this is what we were using, okay? And what came along, the big technology megatrend is uh, shown by this, a young Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, and really the birth of personal computing. You can see in this, this clipping from the newspaper at the time that there were a million PCs sold that year. Today, there's over 300 million sold every year. So in this room full of about this many people, if you divide by 300, you know, maybe there would be four of you that would have used a PC in the room. You know, these were, this was an early stage thing that not many people were using. And so the megatrend that MathWorks took advantage of is low-cost personal computers. The fact that there were now uh, uh, chips that supported the type of calculations that were built right into the chip that we needed to do. The whole birth of interactive software, because prior to that it was Fortran, uh, birth of C and Unix would helped out, and then of course bitmap graphics, uh, window systems, mouse, and so forth. And that led to uh, creating uh, MATLAB written in the C language for a, a bunch of uh, personal computers there. And actually here's the uh, brochure for the first version of, of MATLAB in 1984, and it supported all these golden equations of control system engineering. Uh, that, that were so important. It really focused on, on those types of things. This is one of my favorite examples of the power of MATLAB. Eight lines of code here solves the linear quadratic regulator uh, control uh, solution, the infinite time solution. There were several thousand lines of Fortran code that were in a PhD thesis in 1970 at Stanford that sort of first provided a code to do this. So 1970 PhD thesis at Stanford is reduced to eight lines of MATLAB code about 15 years later. And it shows the power, you know, the power of MATLAB is that these are all matrices. You can work in a matrix form, which is a natural way to express it. So this is one of my favorite examples of, of why MATLAB caught on in the controls community, because this basic expressiveness of the matrix types of problems. Here's the performance specs for a PC of that era. At the bottom, it did 17,000 floating point operations per second. You can see it's 256k of memory and so forth. But then a wonderful thing happened that few people appreciate the extent of. Uh, today's computer... Uh, has increased, obviously, on, by leaps and bounds in terms of performance. But if you divide those two to find out how much it is, it, they're extraordinary numbers. You know, the memory is 60,000 times more. The most impressive one, though, is the floating point operations per second at the bottom. That's over 3 million times more than those first PCs. And that's truly extraordinary and, and enables a lot of the advanced controls calculation, enables you to do um, amazing things in terms of software design and simulation and modeling that, that wasn't possible back then and has been great for tools and great for embedded implementations. So that's what an innovation megatrend is. I'd now like to talk about some of the trends in the last, say, say 10 or so years. I'm trying to roll, set the clock back a bit and talk about what led to model-based design. And really a big trend in the last 10 years is the, be is the beginnings of software and everything. You know, software used to be in desktop computers, but, but over the last 10 or so years, we're starting to get software and all sorts of things. So not just so any software, also more math, more algorithms, more, more advanced things that have mathematics are enabled by that. And there's both systems on a chip, there is systems of systems where, where they're more complex and put together into larger systems. This chart shows how much this is happening. The curve at the bottom is the growth in processors that are put into standard PCs, laptops, and so forth. And while that's growing quickly, it's clearly swamped by the growth of embedded processors. And, and you just look at this and you say, is the world going to need more software in embedded systems? Is the world going to need more controls and more algorithms? Absolutely. And this is just an amazing megatrend. It was facing industry, uh, you know, very clearly suddenly about 10 years ago. You know, here's a picture of a car, in, in, you know, maybe around 1980, a little before that. And it, the, I think the only transistor in the car was in the radio. You know, no airbags, no interlock brakes. And that's, that's over the past 10 years has transformed to today's automobile, where you have 40, 50 microprocessors, maybe even more. There's a set for doing powertrain. There's a set for doing chassis control. There's a set for safety systems. And then there's a set for um, comfort and convenience. Most people these days are buying cars based upon all these software features. 
You know, the basic car is pretty standard, but it's the software that differentiates. Enormous transformation. Along the way, industry ran into some trouble, though, okay? It wasn't so easy to scale up like that. Here's one element of the trouble. Manual coding, in order, in order to write all that software. Here's a chart of the uh, development process in an uh, automotive company. And the part in the circle was the coding part. And this was time-consuming, expensive, put in defects. And they were interested in reducing that or perhaps even eliminating that. Another problem was recoding. When you move to a different platform, you'd have to start over again in the specs and the design for these different platforms. Another problem, physical testing. You have to build these uh, t hardware test setups. Happens late in the process. Uh, it's very expensive to do. This chart shows the cost to correct bugs. And you can see during testing and integration, they're 150 times more costly to correct than if you get them earlier in the design phase. Uh, there was a traditional development process that industry used. It started with research and requirements. They wrote paper specifications. That was turned into design and implementation. And then finally, it was all integrated and tested. It actually was worse than that because there were several different groups often that went into some final system, the mechanical design, the algorithm, the coding, it all went together. And problems arose because, in fact, uh, the paper specifications were used to pass these on. And there was a different set of people. But they wrote the specs and they did the coding in the C. And there were barriers between the disciplines. And this led to no end of problems. Uh, the requirements documents are, are always difficult to read. Paper specs are always incomplete, out of date easy to misinterpret. Uh, the physical prototypes were very expensive to do. Uh, the manual coding, I already talked about that. And uh, the traditional testing found the design issue late, late in the game there. Uh, there was more trouble. In shipping some of these systems, there started to be fairly large recalls, which you're increasing the algorithmic complexity and the amount of software starts to be recalls. And this is, you know, industry was very worried about these types of things. And then finally, there's always the possibility of big trouble. I have a, a, a design I want to share with you that I think every control engineer ought to see before they go out there and practice. This is sort of the most famous failure in control systems, which is the maiden fright of the Ariane 5. The Ariane 5 was a, a new uh, vehicle. There was an Ariane 4 uh, before it, and this was the first flight of the 5 series. Let me show you the video of the first flight, and then I'll talk about uh, what happened there. This is about 20 seconds. Picolage. What happened there is they took the controls package, which was hardware and software, from the Ariane 4, and they slapped it on the Ariane 5, OK? Ariane 5 was a bigger launch vehicle, though. And what happened is uh, there were larger, uh, the nozzle gimbals at the bottom, and there were larger extensions because of the, of the, the bigger system. And that caused there to be l the, the larger numbers floating around in the control system. And they overflowed the fixed point registers on the computer, which they were designed to hold. And so it was a controls failure. It had to do with an overflow. And, and really what it was a failure is the picture I showed you before in the process. If, they, if there had been a process that could have found this in testing, it's just too complicated to test all these parts in all the right ways with the right prototypes and all that. And they just couldn't get all that stuff organized. And it's, it's a great example of what you don't want to see if you're a control engineer. OK, uh, solutions. So solutions started to arise to this. And mainly there's two elements to the solutions. The, the first one is multi-domain system modeling. Let me talk about what this is. It's not surprising that uh, modeling uh, would uh, be uh, a way to help. You know, if you look at, at building buildings, there are building modeling systems. If you try to go build a bicycle braking system, there's obviously solid modeling systems there. So it makes a ton of sense that there, if you're trying to build a system, that there be system modeling. To have system modeling, it's important to be able to model the object being controlled, the plant. Uh, but what's a little less obvious is you also need to model the software and all the hardware is part of that if you want to model a complete system. And if you could do that, then you've got multi-domain system modeling that can capture all elements of the system that you're creating. The roots of this came, uh, in fact, from education, from academia. Uh, some of the earliest simulation software that I used were textual ODE languages. I used Simnon from Lund University. When computers uh, uh, developed graphical capability, graphical block diagrams emerged and were used uh, for simulation. But really, what was needed to solve industry's problem was a multi-domain system modeling package. Now, now, let me talk about what I mean by that. Multi by multi-domain, I think there's like seven domains here. Um, 
Certainly needed to handle continuous time models, you know, for plant and controller models, dynamic systems. Need discrete time models so you can do digital control. It's also helpful for people doing DSP, signal processing, and image processing. You know, image is just a matrix, and so there's image application. Uh, physical models are important if you want to mod model the aircraft or the hydraulics or the landing gear or whatever you're doing. And the basic domains there are electronics, mechanics, hydraulics, and thermal. Uh, on a block diagram, these are differential algebraic equations. The, you know, the lines are bidirectional you know, with a circuit and have voltage or current or something like that, rather than just the, the flow diagram that a control system has. Now here's where it comes to the software. Another important a aspect of being able to model uh, is to ha handle state machines. And state machines are things like um, the windshield wiper controls, your window on your car. They have different modes that you have to go through. Uh, and that's very common, obviously, in control systems. And it's also how software is written, and if you want to model software. Also, discrete event models, uh, queues, servers are important uh, in terms of modeling computer systems, performance modeling, and things like that. And then finally, text-based models are still important. You know, despite the fact that graphical modeling is, is a great way to go, there are some things that just don't look good if you try to wire them all up. You know, this, this dozen or so lines is an extended column and filter. And this is just the right way to write this. You know, if you try to do this with a wiring diagram, it's going to look like spaghetti and you won't know what's going on. Uh, so textual is an important part of any multi-domain system modeling. I'd like to give you an example here of a multi-domain model. It's a wind turbine to, to show you. Here's, a, here's the top-level diagram, multi-domain model, uh, system model uh, of a wind turbine. This is the model for the blades. This is the nacelle. That's the unit at the top of the, uh, that spins around the, that houses the gears and, and the rotor for the fan. There's a tower model. Uh, there's a model for the grid in this case. Uh, this is the, the pitch controller for the, the, blade, the, the blades on the, uh, the turbine. This is the yaw controller. It controls the position the housing is, is porting. Uh, here's the main controller. Uh, this has, is going to have multiple modes because there's going to be some modes we need to take the, the uh, windmill through. And then finally, we need a wind input in order to drive the simulation and test it a bit. Let's look inside the nacelle and see what we see. Okay, in here we have a, a gear train model, we have a generator, uh, and we have an actuator model for the uh, yaw system. We can look at the wind uh, input model. This is going to be fairly simple for this example. Uh, the wind speed, we're simply going to put in a piecewise set of winds. So it's going to start at zero, the wind is going to ramp up to 10 or 12 and fluctuate, and then it's going to drop down to zero again. And then the wind's going to change direction. It's going to move around over the, the course of this, this uh, simulation. And then down here, there's a grid model. Uh, this is a transmission line and, and resistance there as part of the model. Uh, here's the mode controller. In here, we have a finite state machine model, and it's got four states. This is the park state sitting there waiting for the wind to start. The wind starts to pick up. At some point, it becomes strong enough. It goes into a startup mode, which is one that's trying to bring it up to speed. And that's going to try to get it up to 15 RPM, which is the speed it, it likes to run at. Here's a generating mode. That's when you've reached that and you're just operating and, and maintaining a regulator. And then finally, there's a braking mode. If the wind gets too strong or it dies, you need to brake it and slow the whole thing down. And so there's going to be different control behaviors in each of those. And then here's the yaw controller. We can look inside that. In this case, it's just a simple PID controller. So this is a tremendously multi-mode model. There's a lot going on here uh, in, in this. OK, we're going to run the simulation now. If you look in the upper left corner here, uh, you'll see the, the upper chart there is uh, wind speed. And uh, you can see the wind is picking up there. The chart right below that is the wind direction. You can see that's fluctuating around. If you look in the bottom uh, uh, left, that's the direction of the nacelle. So it pivoted to point into the wind. On the lower right, you can see the uh, speed uh, of the turbine. And you can see it ramped up to around 15 RPM. And it's now being regulated at that uh, as the wind is changing direction and, and changing speed. In the top right, uh, you can see the, uh, really the control input, which is the pitch of the blades, uh, and, then the, and then the pitch that's achieved. So there's, there's the command and what's achieved there. And you, so you can see that regulating the speed. Okay, the wind is starting to drop, and at some point it can't hold on, and it has to just feather the blades and break and come back down to a stop. So tremendous amount of stuff going on there. This may be the, the most multi-mode simulation you know, a lot of you guys have seen here. I mean, you know, people don't normally build models this complex that have every single type of mode in it. But this is an example of a highly uh, multi-mode, multi-domain system. So the goal of, the, uh, of this is to have a single modeling environment that, that can model the full system, the plant controller, the mechanical, digital hardware, uh, analog, RF if you need it, the, the embedded software, and then the environment, the wind and things like that. And uh, 
And if you can, then you've got a model system that models the whole thing. And it, can, it includes the various domains. At MathWorks, uh, this is the name of the, the, the so different software packages that we've, we've developed. We have a team of about 500 people that's working on development of this model-based design. This is the life's work of a, of, a, of a lot of people over the last 20 years to build this one environment that can work all these modes together. It's extremely complex. There's lots of instances of each of these different modes that are in the wild out there in different forms, but getting them all worked together is quite, quite challenging. So this is one part of the, the solution to help industry in building these compl complex systems. The other part is a process called model-based design. And uh, industry prior to that had used a traditional uh, development process that's often called a waterfall. You know, there's some research that results in requirements and specs, design, write the code, then test it. And, and it was fairly once through. You know, you had a, a schedule over a year or two year period where you'd work through that. Obviously, you'd have to do little loops in there. But model-based design changes that process quite dramatically. And in model-based design, you start with specifications, but rather than writing paper, you, you create a model. The model is the specification. And the beauty of that is that it is unambiguous, okay, because it either runs or it doesn't. Okay? You can't have gaps in that. So it's executable. Uh, and you also simulate the, its whole system. And you start testing it right then. That's the key thing. Don't wait till you've, you've integrated it and written the code. You start testing right away, validating, and so forth. The next phase, uh, requirements, are done uh, in software. Uh, you create properties and objectives that, that define the re requirements. And then you can put system bounds on the outputs if you want to restrict it as part of the requirements. So the requirements are built in software, again, un unambiguous. The design then is refined iteratively. And this is part of the power of model-based design, is you can do a lot of iterations in the models. It's very hard to do that in C code, or once you've already, you know, are testing it on a piece of hardware. And at this point, you can add uh, fixed point effects or timing or component interfaces or, or real physical things that you have to do to turn this into a design. The result of this phase is an opportunity to, do, to explore many alternatives and really do a lot more innovation. You can try a lot of different fundamental ideas and also find the flaws before you implement. The implementation stage, uh, and th this is one of the more value, high value generating sections, the code is generated automatically. So if you, to write, write 50,000 lines of code or 100,000 lines of code, extremely expensive. Uh, so it, it eliminates the hand coding, eliminates the hand coding errors, and is a huge impact. This is one of the reasons industry really likes this. And, and test and verification no longer happens at the end. It happens continuously through the process. You, it saves money because you don't have to have so many physical prototypes, detect errors, error, and so forth. I remember years ago when I visited um, an automotive test track in, in Germany where they'd used model-based design to design some active suspension software. And we got out there and was talking with one of the technicians, you know, old grizzled technician. And he looked at me and he said, you know, this team is the first guys from engineering that have ever come down here and their design has worked the first time. You know, he'd been there for many years. And of course, why did it work the first time? Well, it's because it, they really had simulated it in the, in the lab, you know, thousands of times and worked out all those kinks. So this waterfall's uh, replaced by this more complex picture that's iterative. You can, late in the game, uh, put things in and move it through there. And, and so the, the, the fundamental items here are the model is the spec, the requirements are a part of the model, you can iterate a lot on the design, you, know, you don't have to write the code. Uh, this is huge for you guys, you, know, you, you control ideas, uh, the implementation stuff is often things you're not that interested in, and you can press a button and have that taken care of. I want to talk now about some of the impact on the industry and share some of the uh, successes in industry using this. This is a picture of, of uh, a Chevy Volt. It's actually me in the Chevy Volt. This is the first she uh, Chevy Volt in the state of Massachusetts. GM bought a, brought an early prototype out to a conference that we had on a student competition. But this was designed uh, heavily through model-based design. They had a very crash program to design this at GM, and oftentimes when there's a crash program, they'll adopt model-based design because there's no other way they could possibly hit the schedules there. Here's a picture of what's inside the Chevy Volt. Well, it has electric drive unit and a battery to power it. But then it has a, an engine generator. So if you write, run the battery down, this engine will kick in and generate electricity and recharge the battery and drive the car. And there's control strategies to make these all work. Here's some comments from the people at GM. Uh, nearly 100% of the software for many of the Volt modules was generated automatically. Uh, here's another one. You can't make an engine and a transmission separately anymore and just integrate them at the last minute. It has to be conceptualized as a system. I don't think you could do hybrid control system without model-based design. Uh, GM uh, has, is using model-based design on a global scale. That they have um, uh, 16 development application centers across the globe that are all doing this. 
Uh, they have models with millions of blocks. They release software every six weeks. People, uh, they're created by tons of people and, and uh, across all product domains. At the other extreme, here's an example of Tesla. Tesla makes an electric car, came out fairly recently. They tried hundreds of powertrain configurations, and they didn't use physical prototypes. This is a startup. They're exactly the opposite direction of GM. It's a small team of people trying to design a car, and it's unusual. You know, it's hard to have a startup in the automotive industry. Comment from uh, engineers there. We couldn't have built this car without model-based design. It would have taken resources that our new automotive startup company simply did not have. This is an example from the uh, European Space Agency, uh, their lunar mission satellite. Uh, they generated the flight code. They said that it reduced their system development time by 50%. Comments here on the simulation and flight code generation played a key role in success. Here's an example uh, uh, that I, I like. It's from Festo. This is a, um, a pneumatic uh, robotic arm uh, that they've designed. This was all done uh, with uh, model-based design. Now, what's interesting in the, on the, um, the, for this particular design is that rather than generating C code, which is what most people do, they generated something called PLC, or Programmable Logic Control Code. So it's, a, it's the same model, but it's generating a different type of code. I have a video here. It's about a two-minute long video uh, to uh, show you some other projects in industry here. And I'm going to try to talk you through some of these. OK. The first one is the F-35, the Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, this has variants for conventional operation, short takeoff and landing from carriers. Look, look at this now. Do you see the nozzles flip down and the control surfaces move? This is just an amazing controls problem um, in, in this vertical takeoff version here. Just a really interesting control problem. Uh, this is a Mercedes car here. No, the right two wheels are on ice, the left two wheels are on pavement, and they slam the brakes on. And they built an active control system that can uh, break it on that type of uh, slippery surface. Uh, when you saw that in the car on the left. Uh, this is a, a man Roland makes high precision printing systems uh, to develop their controllers. They simulate the paper, the control elements, uh, and mechanical structures in, in, on real time on computers. They use field bus uh, and then they implement the controller on the hardware. Uh, this is the uh, first civilian tilt rotor aircraft in the world built by Bell Helicopter. They modeled it here uh, using model based design. Uh, after modeling it, they designed uh, controllers for it here. Then they generated code. Uh, and then they loaded it into a simulator here uh, to simulate it. The, in this case, the pilots fly the simulators. And then they proceeded to, uh, to test flight it. And, and you, can, you can see the interesting control modes this has. It starts vertical takeoff and flies, turns into a flying port machine. OK, this is OHB, a German company. They worked with the European Space Agencies to create two satellites that are called Mango and Tango and that to experiment with autonomous close, close formation flying. Um, uh, here's some state flow diagrams of different states. They parti partitioned the guidance navigation control into three modes, formation flying, rendezvous, and proximity operations. Proximity meant just a, a few, like a meter away. And so they, uh, these are doing various rendezvous operations in space. So those are a few quick examples of uh, projects in industry. Model-based design, where is it being used? Certainly. A lot in large systems like automotive, aerospace, uh, safety critical systems. So a lot of these have to be certified before they can be put into use by the public. But it's also being used in, in smaller systems, in, in places you might not expect. Model-based design using signal processing, image processing, and communications applications that in some cases don't have a lot of control in them. Thermal imaging and FPGAs, uh, a, a driver assistance uh, software, uh, flash memory controller, hearing aids and implants, uh, uh, image processing for uh, uh, pro retinal uh, prosthesis. So a variety of things that don't have a lot of control comment, uh, content. Have, have a little bit here now to talk about the meta-level impact on industry. This is a chart that shows the percentage of time spent in the development stages uh, with companies that use model-based design and how that's changed. If you go back a few years, uh, the largest portion of time was spent on implementation and test. And you see as you shift here uh, forward in time, the implementation goes down dramatically, and the requirements and, and design moves up. Engineers like to work on the design stuff. The design stuff's the fun part, OK? You, that, that's where you get to do the innovation and do the cool things. So this is a, this is a great change. You'll notice that the test remains high. Test is really important. You know, you, you know these are, a lot of them are safety critical systems and things like that. It, it is one area that industry has, has told MathWorks that 
they would like help. They would like help on verification and validation and testing because that's now you know in a very expensive part. And in some ways, it's not value added to the customer. You know, the design is value added, but the system test, if they could reduce that or, or, or eliminate that, uh, they'd be very happy. And it's actually a very active open R&D area. Uh, ideas are very much appreciated by industry in this area because at this point, that's their, their biggest issue facing them. They're very happy with the innovation and the design and the implementation, but the test is, is, is getting them. The next chart that uh, I was going to talk about here, it, it talks about in the automotive industry how the work breaks down between the automotive manufacturer, sometimes called an OEM, and, and then the supplier. And it's, it's a part of model-based design. Uh, it has shifted there, more time spent on design uh, by, the auto, by the automotive manufacturer and less away from the suppliers. In 1990, uh, this is the breakdown of the work done by the automaker and the work done by the suppliers. And, and you can see that the requirements were specified by the automaker, but the suppliers did most of the work there. And that shifted today with model-based design to the automaker doing the feature development and the design and even generating the code through the code generators. And the suppliers are being moved to more commodity types of things here. And comment I have on this is sort of design becomes the high ground. You know, design is where the intellectual property, where the IP, where the innovation comes in that really can, can makes you choose between one car and another, okay? And the automakers want to own that, not have the suppliers creating it and sharing it across all the different automotive makers. So this is a shift that uh, as model-based design has enabled the automakers to do more of that. B because a lot of the simple things are, are handled better here, it's allowed industry to move to systems that are smarter. The minute something gets easier, you can start to make it harder by doing more, okay? And so what are the ways that are making it smarter? Well, certainly more active versus passive systems, uh, more autonomous systems, you know, uh, UAVs, robotics, uh, collaborative systems where uh, there's cooperative uh, uh, behaviors between robots and so forth, and then multifunction, think hybrid electric vehicles. I think every hybrid electric vehicle in the, in the world is being with model-based design because it's complicated here. And, um, and has multifunction versus single. So in summary, model-based design uh, is, a, is a big innovation in industry and in how systems are designed, implemented, and tested. The fundamental elements are it's allowed more math and algorithms uh, to be put into systems. It allows you to, to be more innovative because you spend more time in the early design iterations where the innovation goes in. It's largely eliminated the hand coding that's so expensive. Uh, the quality is higher for these complex, often safety critical systems because you're verifying and validating it early in the process. A collaboration across different mechanical and electrical engineering through the models and, and then across the development stage. I now want to shift to talking about some megatrends going forward in the next five years that affect the industry and I think affect uh, you all. I got four of them for you. First one, the, the algorithm and software and everything keeps continuing. This is a chart that shows the growth in transistors worldwide. Intel predicts by 2015 there'll be 170 billion transistors per person in the world. Now what's interesting is in 2005 there's actually an inflection point in this curve. There's an increase of over 200 in the last 10 years. Uh, so just extraordinary growth here. And of course this is all running software and, and, and largely embedded systems. We're just putting processors into everything. You know, autonomous cars, your washing machine. Really it's going every place. Trend number two takes it up a step further, and this is, of course, the Internet of Things trend. This is basically going to take all these things that have processors in them, and basically everything with an on-off switch is going to get connected to the Internet. Everything with an on-off switch or a sensor. There's a great way of visualizing this that I, I, I really like here that I'll, I'll share with you here. You can look at this as, as sort of the connectivity of the world, and there's, there's three basic phases that have connected the world. The first phase was the connection of places. Uh, this happened over the past hundred or so years where, where transportation systems, sh you know, ships, airplanes, trains, cars, things like that, connected the world's places. Let's say there's a billion of them. Trend two was connecting the people. And this is actually relatively recent. It was the Internet that came along uh, in the last five years, uh, uh, smartphones. It, it's hard to believe it, but the Android isn't even five years old, okay, and the iPhone is like six or seven years old. And that's truly made it so every person on the earth, or, or many of them, can be connected together and communicate. It's, it's an amazing transformation in just, just a very short period of time. But the third wave uh, is, is connecting the, not just the people and the places, but all the things. And, and there's at least 50 billion of those. And so these are relatively recent trends. Nobody really knows where this Internet of Things is going or how long it's going to take or what the impact it is. But it's definitely going to happen. And it shows in the case of the people it happened pretty quickly. My trend number three I want to talk about, which is very relevant for, for this community here in the room, is, is this growth of low-cost embedded processors and experiment hardware. 
We've developed these hardware support packages that connect to all sorts of things, webcams and connect systems from Microsoft, things like that. And we have data from what the most popular uh, low-cost embedded processors are. And those are what we, we affectionately call them ARL, Arduino, Raspberry Pi, and Lego. Okay. These are all very cheap, you know, $30 for these processors. The Raspberry Pi didn't exist two years ago. They just actually cost $3 million, uh, like in the last month or so. Very cheap processors that enable hobbyists and everybody to do it. And this is a huge trend. I'm sure you know, a lot of you guys have seen this. At MathWorks, our, in terms of how we support it, there's two basic modes. There's a tethered mode where you can sit in Mat you can have MATLAB and write MATLAB programs that speak over uh, communication, usually Wi-Fi, uh, to the hardware here, in this case, a, a small robot. The second form is through Simulink, where Simulink ge generates embedded code that gets downloaded to it, and then it's autonomous and can run off and do its own thing. We've worked to develop uh, these hardware support packages. We have like 150 of them. They're free. They're available on our, on our website. This is sort of internal MathWorks data of the, down, of the downloads we have and the installs. And you can see it you know, basically started very recently, just two years ago, 40,000 or so downloads in the first half of this year. So it's a very rapidly growing trend here. You know, we, ha we have a couple of them running in our exhibit. Um, they're being used all over the place. And then the fourth trend I want to mention here is uh, the growth of apps. You know, years ago with mainframes, there were thousands of applications. You moved to the PC, there were tens of thousands of applications. The world has now moved to a third platform, uh, a mobile, cloud, things like that, and there are literally millions of apps. And the message is, is we, all, we all use apps, you know, in, in, to solve lots of different problems. We're used to having a lot of them and using them. And uh, uh, we could use more apps in the control area. That's where people are expecting to have the, their knowledge contained and built. Uh, so here are the four megatrends that, that, that I want to share with you here that I think are really important. I think control you know, is, is, in, is connected to all these things, and, and, and these are important uh, trends for the community. And so now I'm going to shift to talking about uh, some of what I think the impacts are on education uh, and research uh, from these trends. I put the word future in parenthesis because some of you are going to look at this and say, we're doing this today, and absolutely you are. But I think the opportunity to do a lot more is really important and, and could be transformative on education. One, one area of, of particularly low-cost hardware, but it's also driven by model-based design and other things, are this, this problem-based learning. These are a bunch of different competitions. This is just the list that MathWorks, we support these. We donate money to them. We donate, have people that support them, put their time into it. Problem-based learning, these competitions and projects are just popping up all over the place. Major trend. Here's an example. Uh, this is RoboCup. Many of you might know of that. RoboCup is a contest that is um, trying to, by the year 2050, create robots that can beat the World Cup team, the, the World Cup finalists. So that's their ambitious uh, goal. So I'll, I'll show you, I'll run this video. This is an example in June uh, of the contest here. And it's really quite amazing. These, these, these things are, are driving around. They're able to, to shoot it. They're, they're able to avoid each other, pass. They have strategies, so they're working together. You know, it kind of looks like the German team right there. So. If you haven't seen this before, it's, it's truly amazing. Uh, this is, this is um, you know, all the stuff that's going on. And these are, this, is, this is an educational institution that's building this. And this is sophisticated stuff. You know, these, guys, these guys are playing with the big boys in terms of, of strategies here. They're using model-based design. Uh, they have an advantage on that. Not all teams do, uh, that enter that do that. One of their advantages is they're not writing all the C code. Uh, they can do design adjustments r between the games. You know, like if a game is two hours apart, they can go change their Simulink diagram and change the, the structure, not just parameters, and then regenerate the code. Uh, and they finished uh, in first place finish in, in, among their division uh, in, in June. It's, it's, it's amazing stuff. A comment from a person involved with that is uh, these tools help students rapidly develop complex software, including vision, tracking systems, strategy. There's all sorts of stuff going on here, very, very interesting stuff. Here's a less expensive version that, that uh, you guys could, could do yourselves, the Lego kits. The reason Lego is so popular is it's very inexpensive. Y using the hardware support package, you can build a Simulink model. The, uh, this one is, uses a light tracker and, uh, to, to follow a line here. Um, and this is a competition in Japan. Uh, it's relatively easy to organize. People get really into it. Uh, there was a team that used model-based design. Uh, they had first place in the speed portion, some comments from other people. This team was in a different world. Work, I see Simulink models didn't realize the real power of the software. You know, they actually had models of the track and models of the car and all that. Uh, so they could use speed forward control, really, rather than just, just feedback. Uh, here's an example. It's not a contest, but it's a project that, that I think is a lot of fun. This is the die wheel, um, and uh, it's from the University of uh, Adelaide. Let's run this thing here. 
uh, this is something, this is open loop now, and you can turn on the spot, but it's really hard to drive because it's just unstable in terms of the passenger. So in their project, step one was to derive mathematical equations of motion. Step two is design a control system. Step three is to, uh, to simulate the control system. Then step four is to generate code and to run it. And there, there you have it in a stable form. Of course, there's always a step five, which is to show off, uh, which in this case is to you know, invert the thing and be able to drive it upside down. Now, this is a fourth year uh, project at the University of Adelaide. It's a great you know, fun control problem. A uh, comment from uh, the professor involved with this, he said, uh, some of the more accomplished students after doing this project have the skills of seasoned controls engineers well before they graduate. I have another sort of two-minute video that has some other uh, uh, education and research uh, project that I'll, I'll try to voice over and walk through. This first one, turn up the volume a little bit, this is Stanford University. They're building autonomous cars to race. They're trying to beat professional drivers. Okay, look, there's nobody driving that thing. Okay, they're trying to take this around a track and actually uh, compete against professional racers. It's a project at Stanford University um, and uh, that they're working on. Uh, of course, quadcopters are, are really popular. Everybody's seen that around. This particular set's from the GRASP lab at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, they're exploring how quadcopters can collaborate uh, to construct, uh, construct structures quickly. Uh, this is now speed up there, sped up so you can see you know, what happens when they move more quickly. And again, quadcopters are full of all sorts of things you can do. Here's a, we had a simulating student ch challenge. This student by themselves uh, built uh, this uh, simple system to use electromagnetics to control the position of, of a ball. He used computer vision and system identification to design his controller. The deflections in the plane show where the magnets are activated. Uh, so this is you know, an impressive student project here uh, doing this. Uh, this is a Formula Student Journey comp Germany competition. 115 teams from 25 nations. Uh, they're using uh, model-based design to simulate strategies, analyze performance, design of experiments, implement controllers. Uh, this looks like a ton of fun. I can see why the students like this. Great way to learn control. Uh, if you don't want to spend that much money on a race car, uh, this is RoboCup, where uh, they're uh, oh, ran into the buoy, where, where they're working on a, a working. Um, Autonomous channel navigation here, a much more low-cost rig here, uh, but the same thing, uh, teaching different control strategies. This is the Technical University of Munich. Uh, students in this program uh, design flight control systems, but then they get to fly them in a realistic flight simulator. So he's gotten into a, the student has gotten into a flight simulator they have in the lab, and he can actually fly his own uh, control algorithm. Uh, so it's a great chance, to, uh, way to experience uh, what control means. Now a little bit on MATLAB apps. I mentioned uh, the growth in apps. So we've recently tried to make it easier for MATLAB users uh, uh, to build apps we, and to make them visible. There's a new uh, tab on the tool strip where you can see the different apps. These used to be called GUIs, and we brought them forth and made them more prominent. And there's all sorts of different uh, apps available now that are available quickly and easily uh, through that tool strip. What I'd like to do is share with you an example of an app that was developed fairly recently at MathWorks to hopefully inspire you uh, into to, uh, these types of apps. And uh, this one is a, a robust control synthesis. This is a chart that here that has the tractability of the control solution versus the flexibility of the solver. You can put classic mu and LMIs you know, th that have good theory tractability, but not necessarily that flexible. On the lower right side is, is generic nonlinear programming, or you can throw it at anything. And that doesn't have a lot of theory, but it's obviously very flexible. Pascal Gainet from MathWorks and Pierre Apkarian at the previous IFAC, published a paper, a paper where they called Structured H-Infinity Synthesis that tries to put something in the middle there on that picture. This is uh, Pascal speaking here. The world is robust control theorists like to see it. The world is engineers see it who are working inside Simulink. It's hard to connect the dots between those. Uh, what the, uh, Pascal and his team built is a MATLAB uh, app, which is called Control System Tuner. And basically, it's going to use this fixed structured H-Infinity Synthesis algorithm, uh, and it's going to use it to tune a controller in Simulink. You'll specify the blocks you want to do, the goals, you do the synthesis, you'll visualize the loop shaping results, and then update the Simulink block parameters uh, and rerun the simulation. So you're going to see robust con control design now in 50 seconds. You're going to have to watch close. Okay. Uh, so here are the blocks to tune. If you run a simulation, you can see it's a poor match to the reference input that's shown there. It doesn't do very well. So we're going to start the app. 
The first thing we have to do is specify the blocks we want to uh, design the controller around. Then we need to say which inputs we want to do. And then we, we say we're gonna, we want it to match the step response there. And so uh, we add the signals there. We specify the time uh, parameter on that. And, and there's the shape that we're looking for. Uh, and then we want to do the open loop response for the stability margins. So we specify the open loop shape and the crossover frequency there. And we can look at it. Then you run the synthesis. That takes almost instantly on today's computer. Then we upload the model parameters. We rerun the simulation here. And voila, there, there's the, uh, the, the disturbance rejecting uh, after the tuning there on the above. So it matches the step response and has better disturbance rejection. We showed that to people in industry, and they just love it because it, it, it just it's so hard to do otherwise. And it, the, this, this app wraps it all around that. The controls community has, has built hundreds of toolboxes. They're mostly collections of functions. So the suggestion here is there's an opportunity to take some of your, the theories that have been developed and make them in a much more usable form here. The world is starting to expect that. And we've been spoiled by our Androids and our iPhones and expect to have an app to, to do these things simply and not have to program to do that. File Exchange uh, on the MATLAB Central is a place where you can create and share your own apps. There's lots of different apps that are uh, up there already. This brings me to near the end of my talk here. The, the key idea that I uh, have been, uh, uh, been talking about here is, is about how multi-domain modeling and model-based design have transformed industry. And I think there's an opportunity for this to have this, uh, similar type of transformations in education. I guess in summary, the current technology megatrends that I shared here are really outstanding for control applications. I think that the rise of multi-domain simulation model-based design is going to have a far-reaching impact in education. You, know, you can work at the mathematical level with your algorithms and your ideas and concept, push a button and it takes care of the C coding. Some things I think this could mean, and I'm, I'm going to sort of be far reaching on, on this a bit here. I think that hobbyists around the world through maker fairs and, and other areas like that are going to be tinkering with automatic control systems, sharing software designs and apps over social media. I think this, is the, this could be the beginning of an explosion of innovation, small scale development that will lead to startup companies transforming existing industries, create new industries. Universities, I think, are being a seedbed of this next wave of development in economic growth worldwide. I was in Johannesburg yesterday, and I, I met Professor Barry Wolatsky from Witts University, and he's starting an incubator called the Joburg Center for Software Engineering. And that's an example of, uh, of you know, startup companies and, and, and this type of technology driving it, you know, software uh, controls, uh, innovation, uh, the different algorithms. And so there's real opportunities there. I have some calls to action for you just to maybe challenge you a little bit here on, on some things based on these megatrends. Here. Add a project to your course using the low-cost hardware. You know, it's, I mean, some of you have already done that, but, but this is a huge trend. It makes it more experiential. Students respond really well to that. Organize the student design competition. They're easy to do. We ran one in our exhibit you know, dur during this week. I mean, if you can run something in, a, in, a, in an exhibit booth, you can run it anywhere. It's easy to do with the low-cost hardware. Apply advanced algorithms to real hardware to invent something and start a company. This is happening in Boston, Massachusetts. It's happening in California, happening in South Africa. I think there is a real trend here. This stuff is you know, easier than it's ever been uh, to, to just go from the ideas to some type of invention. So I want to challenge you on that. Create an app that allows others to easily apply whatever your theory is to, uh, to get on that trend. And finally, there's research needed uh, on new techniques uh, in the model-based area. Verification, industry is desperate for these things and, and very, uh, very interested in that. You know, I think that these are exciting trends. The world is moving towards you at an amazing pace, and it's extending the reach of control engineers and control theory. Thank you for listening.